from medicines. So building on all of this, and I know we've covered a lot of ground here um, in terms of treatments, uh, both current and what you would look for in the future. Um, and even in that last question, kind of uh, getting to a point that we heard earlier about um, the kind of the transition of the burden potentially being mostly from symptoms, especially for those with transplants, more to current treatments. So we heard this morning that Alport syndrome is a complicated disease. There's many symptoms and health effects, and as you as we've already started to hear, and as many of us can imagine, for each of those different symptoms and health effects, there's a whole number of different types of treatments and strategies that you might try uh, to use to manage or, or treat or mitigate each of those various symptoms and health effects. Um, so uh, I don't expect us in our conversation today to be able to work through each symptom and every single possible treatment. Instead, what I would like you to do is help me by helping prioritize some of what has been kind of the most important treatment related experiences that you have. So what I want you to do is think about from your perspective, are there things that you utilize that, for example, one thing would be something that has worked really well for you. Um, and regardless of whatever downsides or side effects or burdens of that, you found it to be really valuable treatment. A second category that you might want to share is something that you tried that was not at all helpful, that you had you know, tried because you hoped that it would help, and it didn't. And then the third is something that you've tried, um, but the thing that really stands out most about that treatment option is the downsides that came with it, the side effects, the burdens um, of that treatment. And we've heard a lot of examples from our great panel already, um, but I know that there might be similar experiences. There might also be some additional experiences that we haven't talked about, different treatment options that haven't even been on the table. Um, so, so I know it's a tall order to ask you to, to think about all of these issues, um, but really uh, the, I want to open it up to whatever is really most important that you think um, we need to hear and learn from you about in terms of what you've tried to do to treat and manage Alport syndrome. So do we have anyone that wants to get us started on approaches to treating Alport syndrome that they've tried that either have worked well, um, not worked well, or there's some burden that you really want to highlight for us? Yes. And, and just as a reminder for everyone, please um, state your name, your genetic diagnosis, if you know it and are willing to share it, um, and then whatever you'd like to say. My name is Joy Toll. I have X-linked Alport syndrome, and four years ago, um, I finally got started on medication. We didn't even attempt to try the ACE inhibitors because I'm severely allergic to bees, and it's contraindicated. Um, so we went straight to an ARB, and I was on the lowest possible dose mm -hmm. um, up until I started the Athena study and discovered that's not necessarily the right dose. We should consider um, whether or not I could benefit from a higher dose. Mm -hmm. um, so I had to go back to my nephrologist and convince him that trying in a higher dose might be a good thing. And it was a fantastic thing. We actually doubled the dose. And uh, suddenly a lot of the anxiety and fatigue that I had been feeling and thought was just a side effect of being a mom mm -hmm. um, went away. And then we actually increased my dose one more time after that um, to no physical benefit uh, that was obvious, mm -hmm. but I'm reassured in the notion that it's probably helping keep my kidneys from further decline. Mm -hmm. And as a result, if you looked at my GFR, I have, I'm an engineer, so I track everything. If you looked at my GFR curve mm -hmm. um, from as far back as I had data, it was a nice straight line decline. Mm -hmm. And then as I increased dose, it went from straight down to straight across. So I'd just like it to go up, mm -hmm. and then that would be fantastic. Sure. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing that. Other experiences, yes. Hi, my name is Kelly again. Hi, Kelly. Um, 
and I um, most likely have X-linked um, Alport syndrome, not yet confirmed through the testing, the genetic testing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm on a combination of ACE and ARB inhibitors, um, lisinopril and valsartan. Um, in the four years or so that I have been taking them, um, there hasn't been a significant decrease in my protein urea. Um, I'm still about every day like 4,000 milligrams of uh, protein is on my average. There was a period it went down to maybe 3,000. Um, and then I increased my Valsartan so that it's now 320 milligrams a day that I'm taking with 40 milligrams of lisinopril. And uh, I actually noticed on a most recent test, it shot up to like 6,000 um, out of nowhere. Um, so I need to retest that. Um, for me, the most um, the medicine I'm most interested in is something that would effectively lower my protein urea in a significant way. Mm -hmm. um, I also take uh, Lipitor for cholesterol, which works very well to monitor my cholesterol, and diuretics work well for swelling, mm -hmm. um, as well as exercise and low sodium for any pitting edema that I have. But that to me is like much less important because it's mostly just cosmetic. Mm -hmm. um, that's mostly my experience, doing my best to eat healthy and exercise and maybe lower the red meat intake and things like that. <laughs> sure, sure. Ah, thank you very much. It's helpful. Yes. Uh, Sharon Lagas. Um, in terms of helping to treat the condition or symptoms, um, I've been in stage three CKD now for probably I don't know if it's quite a decade, but um, quite a while. And, um, you know, I do take my medications and I've had to add in medications as my disease progressed. As I said before, I'm on um, Losartan. I had uh, problems with taking lisinopril, so I had to switch to Losartan, which does not work as well for me. And um, I'm on Crestor and Allopurinol. But other things, you know, that we do to try and support that is diet and exercise. Mm -hmm. You know, watching how much sodium intake we have, how much protein we have, trying to eat more vegetables. Um, so that's certainly um, a challenge. But I think, you know, trying to maintain as healthy a lifestyle has helped me maintain my kidney function mm -hmm. uh, for as, as long as it has. Um, in terms of my boys, they're 22 and 23 years old. They are on a combination of uh, ACE inhibitor and ARB, and they are, are both are on the maximum tolerable dose. I think my one son takes 100 milligrams of Losartan today and 50 milligrams of mm -hmm. Losartan. I'm not quite sure how he's walking around, but he's doing okay. But his challenge is high potassium, mm -hmm. um, and so he, you know, that is uh, a big challenge for a 20-some-odd-year-old boy who needs to fill up and there's only so much like rice you can eat, you know, <laughs> or pasta. So that's a challenge um, is high potassium. My other son um, has low blood pressure. So he's on the maximum tolerable dose. So really they're, you know, they're doing what they can in managing their diet, trying to lead a healthy lifestyle and taking their medications, but that's it. Like we go to the doctor and they, you know, they, they check their numbers and, there's not much else they can do. My one boy with potassium, they added in a, a diuretic. Mm -hmm. But um, it's really kind of disheartening that it's just kind of managing things and watching it progress, and there's not something else that we can do. Yeah, and you mentioned that they're on the maximum tolerated doses of their ACE and ARB inhibitors. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how, um, how they got to that point and you know, maybe what was you know, the increasing in dose, what led to that decision? and you know, how has that been working for them since they've been gotten there? Sure. So uh, we see the nephrologist every six months. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, uh, they probably have labs quarterly, if mm -hmm. not more often, depending on change in medication. So just um, as their disease progressed and their protein increased, um, you know, our nephrologist would increase uh, the dose of maybe lisinopril and then maybe Losartan. I mean, basically the goal was to get him on the maximum tolerable dose possible, because mm -hmm. that's what he has to work with um, at this point in time. I can tell you that as um, each boy had an increase in dose, they would experience um, headaches, uh, fatigue, dizziness. Uh, but my boys were able to 
um, you know, stick with it. In some cases, you know, the doctor wanted them to say up it for you know 25 milligrams, and they would step it up slowly over a period of time so they can tolerate it better. Mm -hmm. um, and my boys were, um, you know, have been able to tolerate it. We've played around with it. They take an ACE in the, you know, in the morning or an ARB at night, and we've done different strategies to manage how they can, you know, maintain this. Mm -hmm. But they do. They have to be very careful of you know, their diet or their blood pressure, um, their hydration. We live in the desert in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and it's challenging for, you know, 20 year olds in college uh, to do those kind of things. Sure. Thank you so much, Sharon. Other experiences, uh, treatments, maybe some, doesn't have to be a treatment again. It can be really any strategy that you might have employed to, you know, help uh, live and manage, you know, any given symptom, whether it be the uh, renal-related symptoms, the hearing loss, um, you know, what has worked for you? Yes. My name's Jamie Back, uh, auto-recessive, Alport syndrome, I'm diagnosed with a biopsy. I haven't had the genetic test, but the symptoms are leading to auto-recessive. Um, one of my major issues is dealing with the fatigue, mm -hmm. and my primary care physician, she is, practices integrative medicine, mm -hmm. and fortunately my nephrologist is open to some of the um, non-standard protocols that she's tried. Um, we've tried some adaptogens, uh, Shisandra was one of them, um, we always started a couple weeks before my next labs are due so we get a quick look at what it might affect the other medication and that has been the case with several things we've tried it will uh, cause my cyclosporin levels to jump up mm -hmm. and so they've not been an option for me but we have done one thing um, i had a lot of serious trouble with when i wake up in the mornings actually becoming mentally awake mm -hmm. i really struggled with that and it was affecting my work and so um, one thing that has helped that I've integrated into my um, pill regimen is DHEA. Mm -hmm. And um, that has um, helped a lot. Um, plus I'm really also doing a, some, I've been very low in vitamin D, so we're, we're bringing that up. That has also contributed to a, yeah. a positive effect there. But so many other things have not worked out so well because of how it affects the other medications I'm on. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about the DHEA and the vitamin B, you said that it's helped a lot. Can you, is there an example of something that you noticed improve? Uh, yeah, you know, very, some, very noticeable improvement from those. Could you share an example of what that might look like, what that improvement looked like? Well, when I wake up in the morning, you know, I'm, I'm, my eyes are open, I'm ready to go. My, unfortunately, that hasn't translated to my body feeling better in the mornings, but, sure. but um, you know, I can come fully awake. Mm -hmm. Whereas before, you know, it was it was such a struggle mm -hmm. to get myself up and moving, and more right. of a mental struggle than a, even a physical struggle mm -hmm. at that point. Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, yes. Go ahead. Andre Weinstock, um, again, excellent Galport. Um, not so much a drug. Mm -hmm. uh, but a, a recommendation, um, and it, it really is up to the patient to be proactive about this. But uh, I, for various reasons, if I find myself in the hospital, uh, the, the case that you go in, let's say um, I had a hip replacement, mm -hmm. uh, the orthopedic surgeon does not know anything about Alport syndrome. Uh, likewise, my nephrologist does not know anything about orthopedics. Mm -hmm. uh, likewise, and I can go on and on, Mike, there's a primary care doctor. Taking the time to network all the physicians that you have uh, within whatever hospital system you have, and mm -hmm. um, some hospitals are better set up for this, um, never assuming that a physician is going to come in and know everything about your history because they cannot. Mm -hmm. um, they're human. Um, so. It's, uh, I don't have a concrete suggestion of how, how to do that, but that is something that I found that is you know, to foster the communication between the physicians and nurses and everyone who's sort of in the system to help complete the picture so they have uh, information that they need. Sure. So could you either, um, I'm not sure maybe what informed that uh, recommendation, but perhaps either an example of 
where when that did happen, there was something positive that came out of that? Or maybe when it didn't happen, was there something that negative came out of that? I, I think, um, again, to trying to put it into the perspective of what would be most useful for the FDA and for the, the pharmaceutical companies is uh, uh, interested as we're looking at drug development uh, for this is almost in the idea is as we get into more information type systems in hospitals and how classification considering uh, cross warning systems, um, all the filing that goes into drugs, there's still a lot of silos mm -hmm. within the industry. Um, and it, it's sort of at the point that, you know, there are a lot of checks in place for what drugs can be taken with which and um, which ones will have side effects and I think a lot of the constraints on us and usually that'll be very clear within a nephrologist working alone mm -hmm. but when you take in let's say for osteopenia which is another side effect that you mm -hmm. have with chronic condition what drugs are you going to be limited in so there's still a lot of space in there to consider that with Alport syndrome as a condition all the variabilities that inhabit what are the drugs that you might need to treat for osteopenia that do not have something that is a side effect that's going to damage your kidneys? Sure. Great. Thank you very much. Very insightful. Yes, Lisa. Uh, Lisa Bonebreak, X-linked syndrome. But I really actually want to address, um, this is related to my son, Grant, on the panel. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to quickly mention, I know this is about drug development, but also in terms of devices. Mm -hmm. There is so many people uh, have the symptom of hearing loss, and we already have wonderful, fantastic devices, hearing aids, that are getting better every year. The technology jumps every four years like crazy. They're so effective. But I just want to mention that, um, <laughs> and though they're so effective, most insurance companies do not pay for them. So mm -hmm. we know so many kids who cannot afford the $6,000 on average mm -hmm. for good hearing aids. And it's such an issue in our community and so many of our kids are going without. So mm -hmm. I just want to mention that because they are so effective. They bring kids back to life academically, socially, and relationships in their family and just life in general. The quality of life jumps so significantly. Sure. But the cost is an issue for so many families. Mm -hmm. And that is, they're seen as cosmetic by the insurance mm -hmm. companies, and rather than as a need and medical sure. necessity. So yeah. thank you. Uh, very helpful to know that, you know, you feel that the technology is there, it's just a matter of access. Yes. Sorry, me again. Um, I'm Joy, and I have X-linked Alport syndrome. And I thought it would be really important to point out that while I started medication four years ago, I had to wait for 10 years to start, even though I knew it was um, beneficial mm -hmm. because I decided to have a family. And women with Alport syndrome cannot take an ACE inhibitor or an ARB uh, because it can be severely mutagenic to an unborn baby. Mm -hmm. And you have to actually, you're recommended to stop the medication six weeks before you even try mm -hmm. to become pregnant. Um, because of the timing and the knowledge that we had at the time, my nephrologist said, well, it's largely experimental. We don't really know if it helps or not. Um, so I was comfortable not taking the medication. And then, of course, as the years progressed, I learned that that was no longer the thinking. Um, but I still wanted to be building my family. So I mm -hmm. knowingly... Um, took the risk of compromising my health to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very huge and challenging aspect of outports, especially for women. Mm -hmm. Sure. No, very important. So in addition to uh, kind of treatments for um, you know, the kidney disease, and as well as we've heard a little bit also now about the hearing loss, one of the things that we heard this morning, that it was one of almost every time it popped up, one of the top uh, burdens of Alport syndrome was the uh, depression, anxiety um, associated with living with Alport syndrome. So I'm curious if individuals here have experience with, um, you know, either any strategies for dealing with anxiety, depression, whether that be actual medications or other things that might work, or if you want to share things that don't work. Just very interested to hear your your experiences and what, how this community approaches um, 
handling what is very clearly a big uh, burden of the disease. Yes. So for me, um, you know, this whole sort of like not knowing what's going on creates a lot of anxiety. And so um, therapy has helped a ton. And um, I also had a lot of sort of traumatic medical experiences as a kid with like catheters and because, you know, like a lot of people had all these urinary tract infections and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. I ended up um, going to uh, therapy and doing something called EMDR, EDMR, EMDR. It's for post-traumatic stress disorder, and it was extremely helpful. And so for me, because now I'm on like 20 pills a day, I didn't really want to add a anti-anxiety or anti-depression, whatever. So I've chosen to go the therapy route, um, and I've chosen to think of it as a gift. It's been amazing. The whole process has been great, but EMDR was something that worked really well for me. Yeah. Can you describe you know, how, it, how it helped? Is there any example that you can give? Um, yeah, I mean, there, there are just sort of a lot of techniques you can use um, if you feel, because it started to manifest in panic attacks, and so there are just a lot of like techniques and things you can do if you feel those things coming on, but then also for me just identifying like what are my stress reduction self-care techniques. Um, and so that's really helpful tool just to know that I have some tools, mm -hmm. right? But I think that therapy is kind of an ongoing thing is as my disease progression changes and all that stuff, it just kind of brings up new things. And so um, I just continue to do that. Yes. No, thank you very much for sharing. Yes, on the far side. Christine Quick, um, my son has x mm -hmm. Um I, I didn't realize that anxiety was um, a common symptom with outports. But I just figured it just ran in our family, but he does suffer from anxiety and we've tried um, child therapists and, and that helps. But what we've noticed, um, because we don't want to try, we don't want to load him up with medications because he's so young. Um, we have a weighted blanket. I don't know if you've ever heard of those, but they're mm -hmm. uh, usually for autism, but it's um, it works tremendous mm -hmm. for um young children, they can't take medication. Sure. Oh, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, so with my condition being a little different, I had a lot of anxiety just having an attack and running out of the room unquestioned. And um, through the last two years, while I was going through a lot of the tests and the unknowns and stuff, one of my biggest um, ways to relieve all the anxiety was writing and it also helped me tell other people what I was experiencing because therapy wasn't working that was just making me mad because it was like she wasn't understanding what I was saying and so by me writing or me telling a story in my own words I think it helped other people understand and then I felt a lot better about what I was going through because other people kind of knew what I was going through also. So was this like journaling or more like blogging or like? Um, just I've written like I've written a few stories, just like mostly the big components that made me really scared. So like, I wrote some about the first time I got told um, that I had like Alport syndrome, or sometimes that like a few of the misdiagnoses and how angry I was, mm -hmm. and also um, how I felt after the fact because it gave me an outlet where I could be happy and proud of this because I turned this bad thing into a almost a art. Mm -hmm. so. Sure. Thank you, Gabby. Yes. To add to what Gabby just said, I'm Gabby's mom. Um, she has X-Link parts with esophageal oh, leomyomatosis. Um, we did try an anti-anxiety medication with her. Um, she was only on it for about two weeks mm -hmm. when we noticed that her anxiety then turned into depression and the, um, she kind of hid herself away from everyone mm -hmm. um, and then started talking about self-harm. Like life just didn't seem worth the pain that she was going through. So we immediately took her off that. That's also um, a side effect of the anxiety medications is that it can go the other way. Mm -hmm. um, so... Luckily, she did find her, her strategy with writing and everything, sure. but I just wanted to add that about the anti-anxiety meds. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Yes, we'll come here, then we'll come over. Brooks. 
There you go, Chris. Yep, you're good right now, Chris. I'm not quite sure where. Yes. I was said ah. Okay. You're good. Just what I want to say is that the biggest help for my anxiety before I was on dialysis was who pays for the dialysis treatment, who pays for my care. And from the day on I was on dialysis, I was Medicare eligible. And Medicare is the only disease center, uh, or Medicare pays for the only disease centers and end stage renal disease. Mm -hmm. And uh, without any worries about it, 80% is paid for. And mm -hmm. so that was one of the biggest reliefs for me no. that I don't have, didn't have to worry about it anymore. No, it was up to the taxpayers to pay for it. But <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> He shifted the burden and the uh, disease. That was that, great you know, for me. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Hi, my name is Kevin Schner. I'm 32 years old. I have X-linked Alport syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, I actually moderate the teen young adult programs at our regional Alport syndrome foundation, patient and um, researcher meetings. Um, and I get to talk to a lot of youth um, regularly, even outside of these meetings. And one thing that I hear frequently is something that um, I very much experienced. I was only diagnosed at 26 years old. Um, which really wasn't that long ago, just turned 32. And it was completely unexpected. I'm an only child. Um, my mother has Alport syndrome, but she's asymptomatic. So it was a big surprise for me when I found out. Um, so the biggest thing for me was, um, and I, again, I, I talk to so many youth, I hear this all the time, no one wants to talk about having Alport syndrome. I mean, granted, we're all here and talking about it. Um, but it's something that I was very isolated between the hearing loss and the symptoms. I knew my friends wouldn't understand, which unfortunately for the most part is true because they simply aren't in my shoes and don't know uh, what it feels like to have that extreme fatigue or to um, not be able to laugh at a joke because you missed the punchline because you just couldn't hear it. Mm -hmm. um, these daily occurrences that um, you know kind of beat up your self-esteem. So the number one thing that um, I have to say is you have to talk about it. That is the number one recommendation. Um, for me, I went on Facebook. And uh, I started making a, a Facebook page for myself because I was in need of a kidney donor. And when I typed in my information, um, all of a sudden Facebook just popped up in its algorithm, another person who had Alport syndrome who happened to be roughly my age. And because I didn't know anything about Alport syndrome and this person popped up in an Alport syndrome, I messaged them right away and we became best friends. And it's one of the weird things about the rare disease community. I was talking with Jessica from the panel um, about this before, uh, we were discussing uh, American Sign Language and how when you walk in a room, if you know ASL, you and anyone else who knows ASL are immediately best friends. Um, it's the same way when you have a rare, in our case, an orphan disease as well. When you walk in a room with one person, let alone 80 people who have the same disease, you're all immediately best friends because um, you all understand what you're going through. Which is why uh, Joy and Janine, uh, some other ASF staff, moderate. Um, we have something called the Outport Syndrome Foundation Support Group on Facebook. And it is so crucial to not be afraid. Please invite everyone in your family, no matter how reticent they are, to discuss their condition. Because um, the second I start talking to someone else about Outport Syndrome, even if I feel like closed off that day and don't want to talk about it, I just start word vomiting. Mm -hmm. And I know other people will do the same thing. Um, so just know there are resources or out there. Um, we spend so much time talking about the medical stuff, um, but the mental battle with Alport syndrome, I think, is equally, if not as worse as the physical side effects, and that's something you shouldn't um, undersell. Just please talk to other people about it. We're here for you. Well said, Captain. Thank you. So um, in our remaining time that we have to talk about um, this topic of approaches to treatment, um, I do want to make sure that we um, help give all of our stakeholders, FDA, um, researchers, drug developers, a little bit of insights into what it is you're looking for from a future treatment. We've talked a lot about what are the things that are mo most burdening and impacting your daily lives. We've talked about how well what it is that you have is really working and what are some of the downsides. But really what is important um, is to make sure that we have a pipeline of products that you know might be able to help you. And one thing that is very useful um, to the entire kind of um, drug development clinical trial ecosystem um, is to have some sense of what your preferences are for treatment. And so um, the way that I like to pose this question is short of a cure, um, what specifically would you look for in an ideal treatment for Alport syndrome? So I know that's a little odd because I'm saying what do you want from an ideal treatment, but I'm taking cure off the table because I feel like if we had cure on the table, everyone would just raise their hand and we'd go home. Um, but obviously we know that that would be wonderful. But short of that, you know, there a lot of progress can be made incrementally. And so 
um, I'd like to know what would that ideal next therapy um, that you could possibly have, what is it that you're looking for from that? And that could be you know, some benefit of the product. And we've talked about in a lot of the polling questions, hopefully help stimulate what different benefits might look like. Could be related to your underlying disease, could be related to the symptoms that you have um, related to your disease. Could also be, you know, um, you're looking for something that avoids some of the downsides, some of the side effects um, of treatments that you currently have. Um, so really, um, it's what is most important to you, you know, as the patient or as the caregiver of a patient. What what are the things? Start start helping paint a picture, a collective picture of what it is that you want to see from that next ideal therapy. Yes. For me, I think the most important thing would be to find a medication that uh, everyone would be able to take until for like forever. I mean, the, the fact that I'm almost at the highest dose of my medication and once I'm there, there's nowhere else to go is, is pretty scary. And the fact that as my renal function declines, that medication is going to be potentially nephrotoxic to me because of the potassium levels is terrifying because then that would mean I'd have to come off it mm -hmm. or otherwise risk a heart attack. And then by coming off it, that's just going to expedite whatever remaining function I had. So um, my ideal would be for there to be a medication that people could take in perpetuity mm -hmm. that would delay would not even delay, it would just end renal decline wherever you're at and uh, reverse recent damage. That would be fantastic. It would be the closest thing, not a cure, but if mm -hmm. it could reverse recent damage and stop renal decline, I think that would be mm -hmm. fantastic. And that you could take chronically without having the limitations without, without of toxicity. Without the potential for your hyperkalemia and mm -hmm. other things that... Okay would prevent you from being able to take it. Sure. And during pregnancy. Okay. Well, and that's... during pregnancy. There you go. Yeah. Made sure that got into the record. I, I yeah. Did. Yes. Jump <laughs> yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I echo what Joy said, um, that, uh, you know, a drug that prolongs kidney function that actually prevents um, a patient from going to end-stage renal disease is a priority. I think one of the challenges with Alport syndrome is uh, you're taking a drug for a lifetime. I mean, you're diagnosed early. We want people to be diagnosed early and treated early. Mm -hmm. So it has to be safe for um, being treated for the, the long run, and it does need to be safe for women. We've heard that um, you know women have experienced uh, major problems during pregnancy. So that is uh, a major factor as well. So, um, yes. yeah, those yeah. are. Thank you, Sharon. Other thoughts on, on what we're looking for from an ideal next therapy? I'd like to see a targeted therapy that targets the basement membranes, obviously, that would help not only the kidney, but your hearing, your ears. Um, I think the hearing deficits are um, enormous for some of us with um, Alport syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, you know, hearing aids help, but nothing is the same as natural hearing. So if you could um, stop the progression of hearing loss also, that would be huge. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as um, clinical trials, you know, I think if, um, you know, when you're thinking about how you design the trials um, to make it as um, friendly as possible for those who um, participate. Um, for example, if they can do um, home visits, if they can do laboratories at home instead of having to travel um, you know, every month to a site, mm -hmm. um, those types of things will help people um, engage more. Sure. Thank you but for both of those comments. Other preferences for future treatments? Yes. Um, so while you're working on that drug, um, <laughs> it would I think it would be nice to also think about 
you know, when you do reach end stage renal disease, you're like a walking chemistry experiment. And so for me, over the last year, I've started to take, I take like 20 pills a day and a potassium binder. So it consumes a lot of my day and they have to be taken at blah, 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 all these different times. So that's a big deal. But if you could solve one problem for me, it would just be the fatigue. Mm -hmm. So I have two kids, I work a full-time job. I just do not have time to take a bunch of naps, which is what I would really like to do. Um, so if while you're working on that, you could also just do something about the fatigue, yes. I would gladly take another pill. <laughs> yeah. So thanks. No, this is, that's very helpful. There can be, you know, a whole, like I said, we want a whole pipeline. So we'll get you something for the fatigue sooner while we're working on that disease modifying drug. Absolutely. Yes. Um, this isn't quite a treatment, but while we are figuring out treatment, I believe that we should educate more doctors mm -hmm. um, because I think a common thread in all of our stories is that we didn't get diagnosed right away when we first started showing symptoms. A lot of times we either get like, oh, you're just having a UTI or like you get misdiagnosed a lot. So it would be helpful to inform more doctors and um, send doctors more studies based on this because it is becoming more common as uh, families mm -hmm. keep developing. So I believe that we should um, educate more. Yes, thank you. I'd also like to say I would love to see something that can slow the progression of alleomyoma. Um, I know it doesn't affect very many people. Uh, of course, in our life, it's been the focus of our life for the last 14 years mm -hmm. without knowing it. Um, so something that could slow down the progression or growth of oleomyoma or stop it altogether would be awesome. Um, but I think in an overall treatment, even for a kidney, something that doesn't affect or interact with everyday medications that one may have to take because they're not ready for a family yet or they're sick and have an antibiotic or something. So something that doesn't interact or interfere with everyday treatments. Sure. Oh, very helpful. I'm not missing anyone. I got my back turned to you. Okay. Any final comments on anything that we've talked about at all today, really, but uh, particularly on this topic of future treatment? Any any last words? All right. Thank you, guys. You can thank you to panel two. So this is the conclusion of um, what we set out to accomplish, which is uh, to spend the day getting all of your um, thoughts, your experiences, your preferences about living with Alport syndrome. Um, before I turn it over to our um, you know, closing speakers, uh, I just wanted to thank you all again so much for you know, being fully participatory today. Um, you know, as someone that, although I've uh, had the pleasure of getting to work with the National Kidney Foundation before. I am, you know, uh, totally an outsider to the Alport Syndrome community, but um, you all have been so gracious in sharing your stories, and it's been truly an honor for me to get to be a part of your community for today. Um, so I just want to thank you so much for making my job easy by being so, um, so uh, great in the comments that you shared. They were all so on point, and I'm sure as we'll hear from our closing speakers, that they've been extremely informative. So I just want to say thank you. So without further ado, uh, it's a